sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is often described as a growth of a sort of non-functional muscle tissue in response to bodybuilder style weight training. Advocates of this idea that bodybuilder style training produces this type of non-functional muscle tissue often point to powerlifter style training as producing a more functional type of muscle mass. It doesn't have to be the classic three lifts in powerlifting, but the general concept is high weight, low rep training produces more functional muscle mass. However, the problem with this idea is that when you look at most of the evidence published in the science journals, the evidence suggests that the muscle that grows with either bodybuilding style training or powerlifting style training is ultimately very similar at a tissue level. This is important because if there is a non-functional type of muscle mass that comes with bodybuilding cell training and a functional type of muscle mass that comes with powerlifting cell training, then you would think that this functional type of muscle tissue would transfer better to sporting movements. Or if, it, if the muscle growth is of a very similar nature at a tissue level in both cases, then the strength gains that come with powerlifting style training may be more specific to the exercise used. For example, a powerlifter getting good at squats, but not getting good at other athletic movements, such as jumping and kicking. So if you are new to the concept, first to go through what I would call the pop fitness interpretation of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. I'm not going to say this is completely debunked, but there's a fair amount of evidence to suggest this effect is very modest, if apparent at all. Within a muscle cell, there are threads called myofibrils, represented here by five circles in this oversimplified diagram. These myofibrils are part of the cell which are actually responsible for muscle contraction. Surrounding the myofibril is a sarcoplasm which assists the contractile machinery by essentially providing energy and shuttling waste products away out of the cell. There is a hypothesis that as the myofibril is the only part of the muscle cell that contracts, if you could grow the myofibril selectively, you would have a more powerful muscle cell. There is an idea that lower rep ranges will cause selective growth of the myofibril, whilst higher rep ranges will cause selective growth of the sarcoplasm. An alternative hypothesis is that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a normal part of muscle cell growth regardless of rep range and happens as a precursor to myofibrillar hypertrophy. There is an open access paper by a research team out of the United States which I'm going to go through in a minute. But first I will have to add a layer of detail to the information that I've so far described. Within the myofibril there are two proteins called actin and myosin. When actin and myosin slide against each other, this produces muscle contraction. In the research paper which I'm going to go through, actin and myosin are used to represent the content of the contractile machinery in the muscle cell. So to go through the study out of the USA looking at the effects of 10 weeks of high load resistance training, picking out some of the most important details. I will leave a link in the description to this study for you to examine in further detail if you think I am misrepresenting anything. First, to define the author's use of the term high load. To quote from the study, they say, high load resistance exercise involves performing lifts with heavier weights for fewer repetitions, typically one to six reps at 75% of one rep max. To look at an excerpt of the study methods here, you can see the day of the week and the exercises on the two left-hand columns. Exercises such as barbell bench press, barbell squat, trap bar deadlift and others were used. The number of sets and the rep ranges shown on the third column from the left or the second column from the right. Typically four sets of either two, four or five reps. The number of reps in reserve are shown on the far right column. To skip to the results, you can see that on the whole the muscle size increased as a result of the training. The y-axis of this graph measures the muscle size in micrometers. CSA stands for cross-sectional area which refers to the thickness of the muscle fiber generally at the thickest point. The x-axis labels the pre-training stage and the post-training stage. To look at the results more specifically, 
Actin, which as I said before, makes up a significant component of the myofibril, decreased in concentration. Myosin was identified via myosin heavy chains. You can see that it also decreased in concentration. So there is a general trend that the myofibrillar protein concentration is decreasing. In the discussion section, the authors note that a decrease in the relative abundance of actin or myosin heavy chain are indicative of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. I am going to leave this excerpt on the screen for you to absorb the information fully. To recap, in this study, which used heavy weights and low reps, the muscle growth that occurs is actually preferential sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, at least in the immediacy. One thing that should be clarified here is that although the relative proportion of actin and myosin are decreasing, they are not reducing in an absolute sense. They are only reducing in proportion to the sarcoplasm as the volume of the sarcoplasm has now increased. The authors go on to speculate that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy bioenergetically and spatially primes a cell for myofibrillar protein accretion. A slightly less complicated way of saying that is that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is necessary to make space for the increase in the contractile machinery or necessary to provide an accumulation in the energy and precursor molecules which will go into increasing the size of the contractile machinery. The High Load Research Group are not the only research team investigating sarcoplasmic hypertrophy to have speculated that it mostly occurs as a precursor to myofibrillar hypertrophy. The study present on the screen deals with aging, so I'm not going to go over it in as great a detail as the previous study. If you want to investigate it in detail, you can find a link in the description. If you skip to the discussion section of the paper, you can once again see that the researchers speculate that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a precursor to myofibrillar hypertrophy, rather than something that develops as a unique type of hypertrophy to a significant extent in naturally trained subjects. So having seen that low reps may cause sarcoplasmic hypertrophy in the short term, next to look at a longer term training study which potentially gave enough time for the myofibrillar hypertrophy to take place after a period of initial sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Once again, I will leave a link in the description to the study. If you want to investigate in further detail, you can. You can also pause the video to read any of these excerpts if you are running out of time. To look at the study methods, 24 untrained female college age subjects were trained for 24 weeks with a week off in between. Exercises used focus on the lower body using exercises such as full squats, leg presses, leg extensions and leg curls. Subjects trained at 80 to 85 percent of their one rep max for six to eight repetitions. Muscle samples were taken from the quadricep muscle. To skip to the results section of the study, the researchers know that there is an increase in the absolute volume of myofibrils while their proportion to the rest of the cell is equal, which is to say that at the 21 week mark, psychoplasmic hypertrophy and myofibrillar hypertrophy have leveled out. They also state that although the absolute volume of myofibrils has increased, when measuring the myofibrils individually, they appear the same size, which suggests that they split as part of the growth process. So moving on to the issue of how do powerlifters and other strength athletes display increases in strength either without an increase in size or with a disproportionate increase in strength relative to size. The answer likely lies strongly with neural and technical factors. You could say that technique is a neural factor in and of itself. However, before getting into that, I should mention the researchers have speculated that in the case of the use of anabolic steroids, researchers have speculated that disproportionate sarcoplasmic hypertrophy could occur. So the idea of some kind of non-functional muscle tissue could have merit in the case of the use of anabolic steroids. I am not going to go too deeply into neural factors here. However, I believe this is a good infographic describing the proportional contribution of neural factors to strength training. 
It was created by Chris Beardsley, who I believe may be the top strength and conditioning commentator in the UK. You can examine it in further detail via a link in the description. He estimates that 50% of the improvements in strength when training and exercise are due to exercise-specific gains in muscle coordination and relaxation of the opposing muscle groups as compared to another exercise with the same muscle group. Remember, this is when comparing exercises that use very similar muscle groups, for instance, comparing lunges with squats. When comparing exercises that use slightly different regions of overlapping muscle groups, the difference is more pronounced. For instance, a number of studies have shown that short-term squat training can greatly increase one rep max whilst having no impact on leg extension performance. Similarly, short-term leg or knee extension training can have zero impact on squat one rep max. So to wrap up the video with some conclusions. Firstly, psychoplasmic hypertrophy is something that actually exists. Trying to manipulate preferential sarcoplasmic or myofibrillar hypertrophy with a certain rep range will likely have a very weak effect at best. It is much more likely that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy mainly occurs as a precursor to myofibrillar hypertrophy. Finally, it may be possible that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy occurs in some cases due to anabolic steroid use.